So, ich bitte einmal um Ruhe. Herzlich willkommen zurück. Nachdem wir den wertvollen Beitrag gehört hatten von der vollen Halle und der wichtigen Talks, geht es nun weiter mit den Buchpräsentationen. Die Buchpräsentationen liegen in Bezug auf Klimawandel und auf den Wissenschaften und Journalismus. Ihre Intention liegt dabei, Aufmerksamkeit zu erregen auf Klima, auf die Konsequenzen, die unser Handeln geschaffen hat. Die Klimabücher werden, äh, die stammen aus der Bibliothek an unserer Schule, Schule vom Bildungsgymnasium. Und das erste Buch, was vorgestellt wird, heißt Mach Dreck, mach sie sauber. Die Klimalesung. Sie wird präsentiert von Paula Drewes und Ella Melkes. So, ja, hallo. Okay. My name is Emma Melching. I am called Emma Melching, and this is Paula Drews, and we will talk about this book. It's called. It's by Davis Nellis and Christian Scherer. It's called Make It Dirty, Make It Clean. Okay, that's it. I'd like to introduce the author and talk about the contents and the conclusions you can draw. First of all, the authors. As I said, David Nellis and Christian Sarah. They both are still studying, they are um, studying social sciences, and they wanted to write a book that's concise, that's easy to understand, and they looked for it. They didn't find it, and that's they wrote their own book, and they're talking about the big climate change. So the causes and the consequences of the climate change were introduced and also uh, some solutions. Yeah, that's what they do. Let's talk about the content. Let me tell you, it is very impossible to explain the climate change within five minutes, but I will take you what's most important. There are eight chapters. First of all, the climate change is going to be explained, the causes and the consequences. And we can see that we really need clearly better climate protection uh, measures that's being explained than there is an enumeration about energy, buildings, Agriculture, industry, politics and traveling, politics and the society. Unfortunately, I don't have time to talk into detail. I can only give you a brief overview. I can't give you the details. One can see that establishing a climate friendly infrastructure is possible, but we need some sort of steering of energy materials and political, financial, and other aspects have to be included. And Paula, we're going to talk about those. First of all, there are a couple of reasons that I accumulated why it is very important to build that up and we have to cooperate together in the whole nation, the economy, and also all of us individually and the states. And only all of these four levels together can achieve something. So there are requirements that what the politicians have to do, and the focus should be on information and information, for instance, labels, sensibilization, and also at schools. 
For instance, if you look at oat milk, as far as the labels is concerned, it should really be everything mentioned also what is not vegetable. You can do that in school, in subject, then one could have campaigns or also an educational campaign. Then the second uh, strand, regulatory measure, for instance, minimum standards, energy, electronic devices, but also bans. For instance, of technology that's bad for the climate, and of course, what we should do, for instance, percentages of what one can mix in. Then the third um, level is in innovative state. You have real labels together with in a international research projects and also implementing big projects so that climate protection will become established in the society. And then, of course, price instrument subsidies. For instance, you can use some subsidy for um, um, industries that's good and, for instance, uh, taxes or CO2 um, taxes or also a tax on using roads. There are other uh, demands for politics that could be, for instance, a limit balance to reduce the CO2 ballot in the EU, then a climate bonus so that one have social um, balance and that the state supports climate change. So alliance within sectors could help, like for instance, PPPs or climate protection clubs. And we need a change of structure in society so that the focus is on climate protection and there are also measured measures. And last not least, that is something that we can do everybody in every day. That's for instance, one should select climate um, protection to look um, at, for instance, the political parties that actually um, have proclaimed climate protection. And if that is not the case, one should talk to them. The one could generally be engaged for climate protection, for instance, in private life, in school. We, for instance, at our school have a clima workforce. So to tell us what they can do. It's also important that the mobility behavior is being changed and that one takes public transports or the bicycle instead taking the car because that's uh, damaging the climate. And as far as the parents are concerned, that um, a change to climate friendly energy, climate friendly uh, uh, living, for instance, having photovoltaic on the roofs of houses. And what's also important is to change the diet a bit. So towards plant-based uh, diet because meat is not good for the climate and one should Whatever you do, always think of climate protection. For instance, um, close second hand and not always everything new. And we hope we didn't have much of time. And I hope you got a good insight into the book and maybe we raised your, raised your interest to read it yourself. Thank you very much for that valuable contribution. Let's continue with the second contribution. The book is called Dress Warmly, It's Going to Be Home at uh, Hot. It uh, was written by, Esther, by Sven Plöger and Kubilai Kagus and Nola Gerold will talk about the book. Good morning. As Ella said, we talk about the book by Sven Plöger. 
Okay, you can see it now. First of all, we want to talk about Plöger, then a summary, and then we um, describe measures and consequences of climate. This is Sven Plöger. He was born on the 2nd of May 1967 in Bonn. He is what they called a studied meteorologist, and he also moderates the weather. So you know the face maybe if you're living in Germany. He studied meteorology at the University of Cologne. And he wrote five books. Mostly he wrote them alone, but sometimes together with colleagues. Summary, the book was uh, published 2020. Plöger talks about the problems of climate change and the consequences, and he does that in a factual way, and he uh, uh, makes it quite understandable what is climate change, what are the causes and the consequences for the environment. He also talks about the economic uh, backbones, and during, in the book he describes what the measures can be and what could be done in the future? For we look, for instance, rising temperatures, floodings, rains, and typhoons. But you, you see them at the moment in America, not here. But there are also things that, for instance, don't happen here, but they will come to us at the moment. They are in other regions. He doesn't just give an overview of the consequences, but also that we have to change our way of thinking and that we have to become active. Then he talks about energy, nutrition, and social behavior. And now Kubilai will talk about the solutions that Plöger suggests. Thank you. Sven Plöger was criticized in his book that we know a lot, that we talk a lot, but that we don't act. So here you see the measures in order to mitigate the consequences of the climate change that exist. And in coming decades will stay water capture systems against drafts, uh, reservoirs for water against extreme heat, uh, better warning systems for bad weather. This book was published, as we said, in 2020, and Sven Plöger, with his technical knowledge, really managed to lay the ground so that we all can understand it. So what's the target? Thinking. The thoughts about the climate cr uh, crisis should be solved. Uh, first of all, optimism. One has to really, if you, for instance, do sports, you also have to believe in yourself in order to do it. And this is to say it's the same. You have to really believe in yourself that you can regulation of the increase in population. One has to make sure, because Plöger writes in this book, if you have 7.7 7 million mentions, you can all we have now already 8 million billion people. So um, the CEO had that we can breathe out or can be produced is too high. Then we need to have climate conferences because there is a financial fund that was established in order to help. So um, the USA do not pay to the fund. China generally doesn't pay in, and the Arab nations also not. Then steering research about renewables so that renewables become even more environmental friendly, that the behavior of all people changes because most don't do anything. We see that also as far as the uh, politicians are concerned, they talk but don't do it themselves. And then we, he looks at the altern alternatives. You cannot just take away the uh, cars without offering some sort of transport system that's at least as good as the car. 
and one also needs trains or public transport that's on time. Then the costs. Uh, a car doesn't uh, drive on air and love. Uh, there should be a CO2 tax so that these people who pollute most pay most. Then one has to be informed because if you're not informed, you can't do anything, you can't act. We should talk factually about the problems and not really emotional. Then reporting should be checked whether they are scientifically and physically right, correct, that is to say, and that should be achieved. And then last but not but least, one should always look at the time because the um, 2030 one should become uh, climate neutral if we think positively. So we should have more um, laws in order to promote this objective. And polluting laws should actually be mitigated. That's a book everybody would like it. Somebody who never thought about the climate, but is interesting in the climate. Sven Plöger is an expert. He knows what he's talking about and one can trust him. Thank you very much. Good. Thank you very much, the two of us, for presenting the book. We continue. It's called the Climate Book. It was written by Esther Gonzalez, and it's it presented by Anne Frohnwieser. Yes, it works. Climate change is the biggest evil of mankind. The uh, climate book shows that uh, much is at stake. I want to present the climate book. First of all, I talk about the authors. The topics the book writes about, CO2 emissions, what has to be changed, and what you can do yourself. And then a quotation at the end. Okay, now, first of all, the author. Esther Gonzalo was born in 1985. Since 2008, she is a uh, infographic in Hamburg, but also in different countries as of 2013, for instance, in Australia. And she has worked together with uh, National Geographic in Germany, Institute for Climate Physics in South Korea, and also she also uh, is interested in graphic, in graphic garbage screening. In 2009, the first book was written and it began a prize for graphics for books. What book is it? The book is to show the complex topic of climate change using very good graphics and new interesting insights. So we have a quote. It can be, it's um, concise, it's easy to understand, and this topic can hardly be shown better. So, the topics. First of all, it is the significance of CO2 and the climate system. For instance, we uh, the climate system functions in six steps, and 
2% of CO2 are only taken up by the forests, and we should achieve 30 to 40% or the imbalance of the energy management in order to the 0.7 degree per square meter the soil is heated, then the responsibility of people. There are um, greenhouse emissions. They have to be reduced. Or she also talks about the CO2 emission in Germany, for instance, um, how much CO2 was used in Germany. Then, and the emission of carbon dioxide in Germany are for tons. And for instance, tourism, if you think of transport, it's not actually flying, but it's actually there are for their hidden emissions. Then she talks about the various consequences of the climate change, the domino effect, that everything works together, that the ice is thawing, changed living, in general, biodiversity is going down, or scarcity of water. And it means that um, glaciers thaw, that the uh, water level in the soil is going down. And then she talks about approaches for solutions and objectives. For instance, how the energy change and how new renewable energies can be used. Again, you can see now, it's here, now you can see it. To compare CO2 emissions, China, number one, 9,839 million tons of CO2 off pit. Germany is on sixth place, and the last place is Canada. 553 million, million tons CO2. So what has to be changed? Uh, this is shown in the book in a diagram in 10 points. What has to be changed in or what it means that um, food and drinking water has to be assured, whether extremes have to be avoided, more uh, reforestation, change in transport, agrarian and economics, energy and political change, green smart villages, and a sustainable sustainability everywhere. So what can you do? First of all, she starts with good diet, that one should grow vegetable and um, uh, fruit themselves and not eat much meat in Germany, that's possible. Then one should uh, electric consumption, one should use LED lamps, solar panels, um, for car and warm water, insulation in order to avoid um, heat loss. And one shouldn't drive alone in a car, especially in cities. One should actually join cars, join travels. We have a lot of good public transport without having to use the car and or walk a lot or take the bicycle. And it's important to say it's not good for the climate, but it's also good for yourself. And at the end, as a quote, together, as consumers who think sustainable, we can actually contribute to climate uh, protection, political and economic rethinking. Let's grasp this opportunity for a better world. Thank you very much for this introduction. And now we come to the book Ocean Challenge. It was actually authored by Boris Hermann, and it's actually described by Abdu Zamet Zolu.
Just a sec. Hallo? Hello. I'm not Alin or Lale. I am a Busamet, and I'm going to talk about the book Ocean Challenge. The interpreter said already the right name. I talk about the book Ocean Challenge by Boris Herman. So, first of all, I talk about Boris Sermons, then about the major statements of the book, The Consequences. What case approaches for solution? He names them in the book and my own um, recommendation for bias. Boris Herman, who is he? He was born in Oldenburg, that's in the north of Germany, 26th or 2nd, 1981. He is professional sailor and he was the fifth at the Vendée Club Regatta, who was the first Germany who actually made it. And he got the first by the Transit Jacques Vabre Nantin, and he has several victories. I don't want to talk about him really, but about what he says what he writes in the book. So, main statements. The oceans suffer from the consequences of the climate change. We all know that it has drastic repercussions for the ecosystem in the oceans. He also offers good approaches for solution and a challenge us to protect the Oceans, what are the consequences of water is heat, uh, acidification of the oceans, rise of the uh, level, change of the flows in the water and the fishing industry. And you can see the reason CO2. So, heating of the water, it's terrible because it's, uh, for instance, a great problem for the coral banks because the temperature goes up only uh, some degrees but the um, cor coral reef, they suffer and they become ill. It's important for the organisms and also for our coast and for our lives at the coast. Acidification of the oceans, because those the increase in CO2 concentration, more CO2 is dissolved in the water. And that means that there, and that has also an effect for the uh, diet chain. This is to say it is damaged or it suffers under it naturally. So what we see is that the uh, sea level rises. It rises faster than expected, especially in coastal areas, and they're flooded. These people uh, lo lose their homes and have to flee. Another problem is that the uh, streams, uh, for instance, change. The Gulf Stream, so to throw the heating of Europe, they really suffer because when the Gulf Stream suffers, it has a very bad consequence for us. So that means we get extreme weather conditions. And it also has effects on the fishing industry because a lot of people finance their food by uh, fishing and it's a very important food for us. People need a healthy um, ecosystem and healthy ocean, otherwise it's good. Let me actually summarize. Um, um, space is described, coral reefs die, the ecosystem has become unhinged, and the fishing industry suffers. So what does the author tell could be solutions? Boris Herrmann says that one should support uh, uh, renewables as well as a modification to sustainable uh, fishing without plastic, so that plastic waste is being reduced and that one actually brings um, uh, brings vehicles that are better. I really recommend that book to read. 100%. You learn a lot in the book. It's really, it's really um, brilliantly drawn, and I think you can see it. And I think it's a fantastic book because it is a knowledge that you can disseminate without really 
Can I say too much? So that was my. Thank you very much. Yeah, big thank you. Qu quite an exciting book. And now we'll go on with the so-called Plastic Spar Buch, the Plastic Savings Book. Hello, everybody. We are Aidit and Lale, and as it mentioned, we are going to introduce a plastic spar book from Smarticular. So that's a place plastic savings book. Okay, now it's finally working. Well, unfortunately, well, the pictures uh, are only shown now. These show reality reality that has become ever more frequent. Large piles of plastic are uh, on the coasts, floating in the oceans and are even forming islands in the ocean. They are in the water, these large amounts of plastic, which is the habitat of many animals. And therefore this animal habitat gets worse and worse for the animals. And as we can see with this turtle, turtles cannot live their ordinary lives any longer. The reason being that unnecessary plastic packagings, straws, a lot of things that we could actually avoid by using more sustainable or reusable products that can be used much longer and that are also made of materials that don't damage the environment and can be um, degraded much easier than plastic. And for that reason, we came up with the Plastic Sparbuch recommendations on how to do without unnecessary plastic. Doing without it, that makes our daily life more sustainable. The topic of the book is how can plastic be avoided in our daily lives? We find tips and also formulas for that. Uh, Categories, weekly purchase, cooking, household, children, and on your way, and others. And at the beginning, health aspects are also referred to of different types of plastic that we encounter in our daily lives, of which we don't even know how dangerous they can be. Replace plastic, an app, and Coast Against Plastics, Marticular, tries to counteract the amounts of plastic. What you can see here on that picture is an example from the book. It's the pyramid of sustainable consumption. You can use that as a guideline on how to behave. If you purchase something new, instead of buying it directly new, just think about the fact whether there's something that you could rather repair and use. That takes us to the author of the books. Smarticular is an idea of portals for simplified life. The book consists of lots of recommendations and formula that were developed together with the readers and also tested together with them. At the beginning of each chapter that Eileen also referred to, there are readers' tips. That's the influence of readers in the kind of comments, comments similar to your comments that you post on the internet. You can also Google Smarticular and then have an influence on the, on the ideas and on this formula because your comments will also have an influence. We heard about Organization Against Plastic, which was set up in St. Peter Ording, Küste gegen Plastik, that's a, a German name of it, and it is against maritime pollution. Replace Plastic, that's an app that you can download. This app gives you and also all the other consumers the possibility to send pre-written mail to manufacturers and to really force them to or, or to refer to more sustainable packaging that does not consist of plastic to make that more understandable we came up with some demands 
The first one, the most general one, is that we pay heed to plastic in our daily lives and uh, do also do without it. And uh, consumption variants are recommended for that. Second, in order to, to change something, we should encourage uh, everybody living around us and make them also attentive to it. As a large mass, we become more critical and will reach our objectives more easily. Plastic seems and more harmless than it is and the consequences and pollution should be taken seriously and we should start acting actively. And the last of these goals, we should try to really um, do away with the plastic standard. It shouldn't be the norm to buy tomatoes packaged in plastic. It should be the norm to take them along without anything or in our own packaging. We realize that everything leads to the fact that it's up to us now. In order to live peaceful on this earth from now, without being swamped in plastic, we have to do something. Every little conscious action will count. So, lieben Dank. Thanks a lot for the last presentation of books, now the practical part. Up to you now. Do you have any comments, questions, answers? Let's collect them. We'll collect them now. Use the QR code that you can scan on your mobile phones, which will be collected on a portal where your demands, your ideas about sustainability and environment um, that you come up with can be noted. Dafür sind veranschlagt zehn Minuten. We have 10 minutes for doing that. Ihr könnt dafür natürlich auch gerne mit euren Sitznachbarn oder in eurem Umfeld auch gerne euch in kleinen Gruppen zusammentun. Well, of course, you can join forces with the neighbors uh, sitting around you with others and form groups.
So, die zehn Minuten sind vorbei. Ihr erwartet fleißig, ich habe sehr viele Fragen und Anmerkungen. Well, the ten minutes are over and you wrote down quite a bit. Und im weiteren Verlauf... Let me read out the demands and also the recommendations. First question or statement. Companies should not touch anything in plastic or um, without producing sustainably. Who made that concrete demand? Can we start the question? How do we imagine that? Oh, Sarah, Sarah, can you please come here? Maybe you even know companies who produce in such a way and maybe sends or dispatches things that you're ordering also in such a way. Many companies do produce a lot of things. Well, there are some companies that produce things environmentally friendly, but a lot of them don't do it and also transport them in a way that's not environmentally friendly and things contain a lot of plastics which is absolutely unnecessary and you could really change a lot in the future. Who knows, for example, companies that do transport things in an environmentally friendly way, for example, that they don't use plastic or that they provide recommendation on how the packaging material can be separated according to types of packaging material. I know about some companies uh, who transport things or, or uh, work carriers that produce their packaging themselves and uh, say what is to be transported and what. I mean, that's not rocket science. We've got a dual system, a so-called yellow garbage can or yellow bag in Germany where you do dispose of packaging material but when ordering something and uh, uh, most of us do it uh, that we are ordering hopefully not from the major internet platforms who have a very negative footprint in view of all the material that you're ordering so next question Linus a big thank you for that contribution the next question how can climate protection be implemented in a socially friendly way, in a socially just way. Is that a question that the asker would like to comment on or any ideas about that? Have you discussed that, for example, in uh, your lectures at school? In your classrooms? I mean, I'm very confident that you probably discussed that in your classrooms before regarding, for example, taxes on CO2 emissions so that those who emit lots of CO2 and buy products with a very high CO2 emission that these pulp products should be made more expensive and the more CO2 intensive you live, the more you have to pay off the follow-up costs and people who don't that much money will benefit from that money because people with a lower income can have things uh, that cost less and then you can reshuffle money in society. One could allow people who don't have that much money available that they can live in a climate friendly and behave in a cli more climate friendly way. Then a third question, why are governments so slow when it comes to climate policy? Well, I hope that somebody stands up now and says, that's my question, what's bothering you? Come on. Well, yes, I wonder, and that was something that was a really a, a hot issue in the electoral campaign, and you don't hear, uh, you, you hear hardly anything about that. No, you don't really know what's happening. 
All these questions and demands that you have will be collected on a tablet after this conference and we'll pass that on to our district councils, the local Landräte, the mayors and lord mayors in the OWL region. And these questions and demands will be presented to them. You're absolutely right. We should try to really pass that on and forward it to our um, government. There is a European project that brought us into contact with the Ministry of Economy and the Ministry of the Environment and will also pass on the questions to them. What's decisive that the pressure from the basis is really channeled upward because without uh, the, the gener your generation, last generation, the government wouldn't be so much under pressure to do something in, in order to keep up pressure. We should try to get these changes implemented also at the political level. Well, I think the next question is really good. This pressure, Bielefeld Climate Week, couldn't one have the banner, or does that have to be on a, on a plastic fabric? We actually chose that material, that fabric, on purpose because it is a fabric that's rather flexible. On that banner, you don't see the year, you don't say uh, it's the 15th Bielefeld Climate Week or it's the 15th conference, but it's rather something that we are using every year again and that on purpose. So we can do that for the next 10 or 20 years, uh, well, depending on how long we'll continue to exist, hopefully even longer than that, because we intend to live a, a bit longer than that and shape our future in a way that we will get there for a long time to come so that we can all reuse it. Now sometimes logos will change logos. In that case, we'd have to redesign it and hand it back for recycling. We're talking about one type of fabric, so it's easy to dispose of it. Plastic as such is not really bad. One should, of course, try to reduce it and use it really in a purposeful way. And when recycling, then according to separate types. But avoidance, that's at the top of the list, and a use of products for a long time. So, I feel, I think there's a minute left. Let me now take the opportunity. I mean, the break may be a bit too sudden, but maybe you've just uh, had a drink and you have to take a bio break, Linus. Well, at 12.15, we'll continue with a wonderful presentation about mobility, but I'll hand then back to you, Linus, and hopefully everybody will be back on time. So a big thank you for this excellent, uh, for your excellent contributions in the panel discussion. We'll also uh, discuss it in more detail. Now we'll have a short break. Please be back on time at 12.15.
So, ich bitte einmal die Plätze einzunehmen und Ruhe, bitte. <lacht> So, es geht jetzt inhaltlich weiter. Der nächste Beitrag zu Mobilität. Okay, next item on the agenda. Mobility, Hagen Knoll. Und vorgestellt. Er stellt die Zukunft der Mobilität und die... In der Talk about the future of mobility and how this will be shaped, Hagen Knoll. Mobility Advisor for Mobility Transformation and the Automotive Sector. Vielen Dank, Leines. Lasst uns... Lasst uns mit einem kleinen Thanks, Linus. We start with a thought experiment. I'd kindly like to ask you to do the following. Just think of a telephone. A telephone. Just imagine it in your minds. Now, give me a, a brave show of hand. By whom thought about something like that? Wer hat an so etwas gedacht? Who thought of that? Und bei wem? War das Telefon ein altes um, for whom it was an old Nokia? An old Nokia? Well, who thought of a smartphone? Well, okay. I brought along another example. Just think about a camera. A camera can take that shape, can look like that. Well, if there are any people who are love photography, who thought of a smartphone again? Well, wonderful, thanks. Kank knows my name. I'm a manager at MHP and we are a subsidiary and consultant company for IT and management consultancy. Our customers mainly come from the automotive sector and manufacturing. Well, that's part of the DNA of the company. We are part of the automotive industry. That's where our roots are. But company groups such as Bertelsmann, Chibo and Eins und Eins form part of our customer base. My focus is management consultancy and e-mobility, charger infrastructure, charging services, and then also business model based on that ecosystem. Today we're talking about the future of mobility and how to shape that future. It's really cool for me being with you today because that brings me full circle into ways my professional background and also my roots. Jens mentioned it a few days ago. I was a co-founder of the initiative behind the Klima Woche. I was uh, a graduate from Friedrich von Holstein Gymnasium in Climate and Energy was one of our working groups. And now I'm once again part of that growth initiative in order to make a contribution based on my professional background. Now that guy who some 15 years ago went to school in Bielefeld and uh, nowadays works in the automotive industry in a consultancy company asks you about a telephone and a camera. Wouldn't it be easier to ask about what a means of transport, for example, a passenger car? Well, a passenger car has a disadvantage as compared to phones or cameras because we are at a junction, transformation junction that others have already behind them. E-mobility. Had I asked about a passenger car, the picture would have been even more diverse than the other shows of hands up. One would have had a sports car in their minds, the other a pickup transporting things from A to B, or another about a stinking thing just to get from A to B. But the development of mobility, that uh, is something we'll focus on in the next few minutes, you'll probably realize that when, when people are up on stage and uh, talk about something, they probably start very, very uh, way back in the past, but we're not going to go way, way, way back, but just a little bit, not thousands of way. So the invention of the wheel, that uh, was the basis for everything that we tend to call mobility today. So getting from A to B. And anything that we use in terms of vehicle, apart from our legs, to bring us from A to B is based on the big quantum leap. 
the steam engine, the industrial revolution, uh, revolution that was the basis for lots of things that has happened in the last 300 years, another 100 years, until the first steam locomotive was seen in Germany. Just a few years later, the first E car drove around in Germany, another five years, until we had the Benz patented motor engine or that, that uh, was really the founder father of all passenger cars. Three years later, engineers trust that much in steam engines that they sent a steam line across the ocean without sails. In the past it used to be a mixture of wind power and steam engine, but uh, 30 years before the Titanic sank, it started with a steamer only, a steam liner. Then in automotive industry in 1908, Henry Ford founded the new production ways with the assembly line, a milestone of mobility. In 1938, VW Berg or Beetle, when during the time of the economic miracle, was has become synonymous to mobility and the radius in which we use, uh, which we move, became much bigger, much bigger in the 1960s. The first uh, flight could only be afforded by rich people in the 1950s, but in the 1960s, all of a sudden, most people could afford using an airplane, and therefore their travel radius became much bigger. Now, another tile is missing, but there was so much that happened between today and the 1960s. That tile was filled by the Tesla Roadster at the time still based on a Lotus, so an old transmission, alternative transmission system was then launched again in the market and uh, really triggered lots of other developments that uh, ever since 2006 right. followed uh, in a lightning speed such as uh, sharing car sharing or e-scooter sharing, Uber or Liferandos are somehow also based on that kind of technology and also various other applications. The digital world made possible because of the smartphone. Now let me uh, look a little bit closer together with you and uh, that takes us back to a certain time in the 1970s. Similar to today, the 1970s wanted to be mobile, they wanted to get from A to C. In the 1970s, they did so mainly by using their passenger cars, their private cars. So automotive industry was here synonymous to various branches of uh, mobility, but the same also applied to, uh, tr to trains or also the aircraft. You want to get from A to C, so you have a mobility ecosystem based on fuel and gas supplied, supplying fuels and lubricants, or for trains, or coal prior to that. On the other hand, you've got the producers of the mobility product as such, a car, a vessel, a train. They can't live without each other, but they can't really do with each other either. So one supplies what you need in order to operate the other and the other do supply the hardware, so to speak. Over the course of the last hundred years, technological progress and also new regulations accompanied that. So for a hundred years, we kept developing a technology further and perfectioning it which is the combustion engine. Now, what about today? Then it strikes you that these two ecosystems keep growing together. Mobility, this requirement, is what's still in the focus of attention. But energy, that ecosystem has become much more diverse and same applies to the mobility ecosystem. There is a much bigger selection on how to get from A to C. 
So we are growing closer together. I brought along an example, Volkswagen. We heard about that before with Volle Halle. The deeply rooted mobility ecosystem. I think there are hardly any. There's hardly any other company in Germany that would consider to be a mobility company. They've announced their third big milestone in the corporate history, the VW Beetle, then the VW Golf, and then the VW E initiative, electric initiative ID3 is the next milestone. What are they doing? They're setting up a subsidiary called Electric Light, in short, Ellie, in order to expand their charging system for e-vehicles. One could think that the first product would be a wall box or something intended for a car. Just imagine what the first LE product has been. Well, that was the electrical power tariff. You can order it. So they changed on the side of the energy ecosystem and said that, that is what electrical energy costs. So they interfere with the other ecosystems, so to speak. Aral, Shell and BP, they're doing just the same by setting up charger infrastructure in order to safeguard the business that they've built up um, relentlessly over the course of the last years. So that combination into one single ecosystem in order to meet the demand of mobility that changes everything and uh, because of bureaucracy uh, and regulation there will be an effect on that but the potential to be tapped because of that growing together is something we can not really foresee today now we come full circle again and come back to the phone and the camera you've got different ideas in mind because you're digital natives and you understand mobility is something totally different than what we had in the last years than I see or the, my parents or the parents of my parents. You might say it has not been characterized by decades uh, of things. You don't uh, think in terms of a combustion engine when it comes to individual mobility. In order to show how mobility will develop in the future, I brought along four different theories and we'll have a closer look. These are all theories based on my experience, of course, in the automotive industry. But in the end of the day, that's my crystal ball. It is just my opinion. It can become true, but does not necessarily have to become true. Well, mobility will become autonomous. Autonomous means two things. A vehicle that will move independently, autonomously, but also the processes underlying it. So charging procedures that will be automated, robots that will take over certain procedures, but also automatic steering of logistics processes. Mobility will become autonomous and automated, not only when it comes to cars, but also in long distance traveling and all the different processes associated with it. Same image, but different terms. The future is electric buses, battery operated trains on routes that are not yet electrified and uh, e-scooters, um, motorcycles and the cars, all operated electronic, electrically. Green hydrogen, well, that's an alternative, especially in um, energy intensive companies the steel industry, for example, or also uh, in uh, operating ships or aircrafts. But uh, green hydrogen, in my opinion, is not suitable for individual cars. The electric drive is, is the most efficient ones, one that we've ever had. Thinking about the future, 47 million passenger cars that are the ones in Germany if all of them were to be electrified operated electrically then 25 percent more energy would be needed if we wanted to do the same with hydrogen we'd need about twice as much the e-future is also important for another reason and uh, the third theory Supercharging will become the new normal. Lamp 
charges, slow ones, will disappear from the cities because cars will also disappear from the cities. As a means of transport, they will withdraw slowly from the urban areas, supercharging parts will solve a problem that we have today, parking. We don't have enough parking spaces for all the cars that there are. There are nine cars for one parking place in Cologne, for example, today. If I want to really meet a big demand, a lot of these cars will have to be supplied with energy and slow charges have a different business case. If I want to make money with that, that's because of customer loyalty. I'm a fitness studio. I have operate a swimming pool. I'm a big shopping mall and I tell them, dear customer, if you charge here, you can stay 15 minutes longer in the sauna or you get a, a discount of 10 euros on what you purchase. But if I want to make money with charges for cars, I have to charge as many cars as possible with as much energy as possible. So supercharging, fast charging will become the new normal. Bielefeld, I'd like to comment, does have to do a lot of catching up because the charging structure doesn't even cover the today's need. So we can charge the cars for 20 minutes when we do our shopping and we do that uh, over and over again. Now the electric car, so uh, all those with a big storage will make a big contribution to the energy transformation because they will turn from a consumer to a storage. Instantly a car can change energy into kilometers. So for the energy industry, that's plenty of storage that can be used. Smart charging, intelligent charging, communication between all areas within that ecosystem is very important for that. Just imagine that you're all getting home today and uh, if you were all to connect or plug in your cars, then probably all lights would stop. And the same would happen if we, in a hundredth of a second, would all switch on our ovens at the same time. The consumer and the charging infrastructure and the entire ecosystem used for energy generation that means it, it all of that all that will communicate knowing that you have to go to school tomorrow morning if you have to really get started at seven then the car has to be charged whether that's done during the night or at six o'clock in the evening or early in the morning doesn't really matter now other cases vehicle to x vehicle to something and i brought along three example vehicle to home which is one example. So household with a family of four requires two and a half thousand to four thousand hours of energy per year. That's what the statistical information office says. And if we say four thousand hours that we take out and divide it by 365 days, then I end up at about 11 kilowatts per day, meaning if my average storage of a car is assumed, which is 60 kilowatt hour, my house could be provided with energy from the car and still drive the car for 200 kilometers. We go to grid. I feed uh, the energy into the grid in order to stabilize it. And there is one special case, application case, and Fale Halle also alluded to it. There's a lot of stone. That doesn't mean that we uh, use a lot of electricity. That's happening with wind plants because we can't use the um, electricity uh, because we can't use it and they can't store it. Um, and they just are switched off. If we had green oxygen or huge reservoirs, then we can actually have a business case and use the energy. So 
vehicle to grid means that the vehicle can give the energy to the grid and vice versa. Vehicle to device that's not actually the whole vehicle, but it is the battery of the car, or for instance, in a bus. There are some of the hubs in the bus. So the vehicle, this is said, the vehicle reservoir charges another device. For instance, for operations of um, something to cut the hedges. But one can also say the uh, diesel charger that's maybe in an office will be replaced by this. Why is that so important? Because it's not only the contribution to energy change. On one hand, we have the mobility change with a big masses of reservoirs, digital development in mobility and the potential. And on the other hand, we have actually the energy transformation with a lot of fresh energy and less dependency because there will be synergies. The one can function without the other. Steve Jobs in June 2007 goes and introduces three in one devices, a phone, an Internet Explorers and an iPad. And this is the beginning of the smartphone age, something that's today for you to, it is totally normally. Uh, for instance, that the telephone actually uh, say calls emergency calls. If, for instance, you have a skiing accident, does this is something that the visionary Steve Jobs couldn't know at the time, and this is exactly where mobility starts. One has apps via the smartphone, via the mobile device, all that that you use in order to plan a journey from A to B is mobility. So mobility becomes a digital process and you can make use of it in order to also shape the digital future. Because all of you want to go from A to B, that's passive, but you can also be active. One asked me to tell you the following in future. I think there will be a big transformation. So everything that established uh, players, companies, the big um, automobile manufacturer really have to rethink and have to redefine themselves. Um, and I think this is a journey. There are companies who will manage to do so. And there are companies who already managed and will support the others. There are many entry possibility. Um, we are one of the companies who will accompany that. And we want to go into a dialogue now. I brought you here a quote and also my email address if you have any questions about anything what we do what our consultancy is or if you have a question about the future of mobility please contact me and i think we have one or two uh, minutes for potential questions so if you have any questions i would be um, i'm looking forward to the discussion that we have afterwards and thank you very much I've heard A. The micro has is on all the time. We don't have to switch it on because there are others who will switch it on for you. They work in the background. I'm Ralf Legenhelfen. I'm from the Friedrich Wernand School in Paderborn. I would like to know that it's only a question of distribution. And one assumes that the whole energy quantity is sufficient. But we only know that a lot of CO2 is produced in order to actually produce that amount of energy. How can that be implemented in view of the fact that in our planet temperatures are rising and 
uh, we will have a heat collapse. I don't really understand it, but you talk about over distribution, storing back, but the quantity, where will it come from? Thank you very much. Similar in the cars, all developments in industry, the change from one day to the nether, that's not a scenario that can be achieved in a few days or years. It's all long term. Uh, mobility, this is say, um, goes up in pieces and also expansion of energies is piecemeal. We have already energy from uh, regenerative sources and it has to really come to a green mobility and um, as long as the two go together and rise at the same pace, I think it's feasible. But there's something we shouldn't forget. Consumption is shit. We heard that in one of the book presentations. Because we use too many resources and that has a footprint. And the question arises, can we go from 100 to zero? Of course not. So how do we design that transformation of that means in order to change mobility, to transform traffic means we need a lot of resources at the beginning. We talked about the raw materials like silicon. This is a lot of work, but in a lot of years, it will be fed into a circular economy. This is to say that the expenses and the raw materials will be used forever again. I would say, let's start now with the discussion, Martin. From for Halle Hagen Knoll and Professor Netz Mauer from the University of Advanced. So I start with the panel discussion and we talk about the topic. We have three guests and one place is open. If you think you are willing to actually sit, then you have now the possibility to do that. This is to say the last place you can change it and I'd be very pleased if one of you would take the third place. Just come and then you ask a question. And then you can go again. You don't have to stay here the whole podium discussion, just for a question maybe, and then you go down again. Is there somebody who would be willing to join? Otherwise, we work. You can also start uh, in the podium discussion. It's always possible. So what's the big questions? How is it possible to actually implement the transformation of traffic socially and um, environmentally friendly. So what do you think? What's the, okay. I, okay. Shall I uh, continue what I've just said? Yes, please go ahead. I think that the automotive industry is a big driver for innovation because Everything that was actually achieved has always been driven by the automotive industry, something luxury. They have a pioneering te technology as far as transformation is concerned, and slowly it became normal. Today it's normal to use an e-bike or an e-car, or maybe in bigger transport medium and then at one day traditional motors will be the exception if we think it to the end shall we all answer to your question or what do you think okay the question was future of mobility yes 
I'm a professor at the university. I live in Bielefeld. And I, when I go to work, I try to take the bicycle or walk whenever it's possible. Yeah, thank you very much. I didn't say that in order to get an applause. I love my bicycle. What would I say? We have to go away from the thought that we live in the bogs and work in another city and have to travel long, long times. This is mobility. Hagen actually mentioned that people want to be mobile, but that I would question mobility. Yes, but not that we just go to Dusseldorf in order to do shopping. That's the wrong mobility. We have to reduce our mobility to where we live and where we walk. Okay, then, okay, I have a car. Yes, yes, I have a car. But I don't really need a car. If there would be a useful public transportation. I lived for a very long time in Gießen and uh, without a car. And then I went to Krefeld. Okay, I had a, a car because I had my kids. That is something what we need. We need sensible um, public transportation. Vacation. And if one has to travel long distances, one should really use the train. And only when it's absolutely not possible to use something else, only then we use the battery of the e car. Um, hmm. um, Microworks. I would, in order to ask that, I would like to. Uh, talk about the previous question because it hasn't really been answered. You said 50% of energy today in Germany is uh, produced regeneratively. That's not correct. 50% of the electric current. This is uh, produced regeneratively. But the problem is that in future, we need enormous numbers of things that have to be operated with electricity that now we operate them with, for instance, gas. And I heard if we look at the total energy consumption in Germany, then regenerative is about three to five percent. So I agree. We have to get used to the fact that, that there must be clearly less mobility because if all the energy we use in uh, Germany from heating, from boilers, if we actually use regenerative energy from solar, wind, hydrogen, then we don't have that much uh, energy available. Today we have through fossil energy. This is a we have to move less. Uh, do we say we have to actually say we're losing something or shall we say we're winning life of quality that we don't have to hurry, hurry, hurry instead of taking the bike? I didn't think about this. We have to have it like that if we don't want to be rolled over by the climate crisis. This, Fabian, thank you very much that you come. So, a uh, pupil. One can hear you. Thank you. Mobility in future. What does it look like for you? First of all, I have a question to what you said. I thought that the focus in future would be rather on electromobility. And my question is, would it be possible to use other energies like hydrogen driven cars? whether the focus should really be on electrical energy e-cars or maybe one should use other fuels and not only focus on electricity. This is just unilateral, a focus that's unilateral. Finally, it meets demand. The big industries, we have them, and their big distances have to be covered. 
That's a different question. Then one needs alternatives to an electrical battery driven automobile. But we would have a use requirement with all these limitations. The question is, does everybody need a car? So that means the basic resources are used. That's something totally different. I limit myself for a good reason for the two technologies, hydrogen and e-drive, because everything else, in my opinion, is not something that will lead to somewhere. E-fuels can be that the cars that are today on the cars and they charge, but you have 14 year old diesel monster on the road still that can be driven until it's replaced. But that's not a technology that is future orientated, especially if you talk about new cars. Can I say something? I said, we don't know at all how so much regenerative uh, electricity can be produced in order to operate everything we have. If we have uh, hydrogen or e-fuels, they even need more energy. If you tank electricity into a tank, not that much is lost. But first of all, if you use electricity in order to produce hydrogen, you use much more energy to drive the same distance. And that's something we cannot afford at all. I think batteries is better because hydrogen use so much energy, it won't work. Even there are politicians who always talk about this. We can't afford that. And that's the problem. It would be wonderful, but it won't work. So you think the focus should be on less energy in order to invent more. For instance, we should take the bike more, but I think that's the only way we can do it. So you want to sell it positively, your ideas. We had the pandemic and we used digital environments. Yeah, I like to travel, but during the pandemic, we really only use Zoom conferences. We virtually met with France and together we actually wrote a research project. Virtually, it went wonderful. I was surprised myself. And those are modern types of working together. I'm sure one has to travel because one can actually work better together when one knows each other. We knew each other. I would want to have the first meeting in persona, but others then, you can then reduce travels to a necessary minimum. Energy production, yes, that was quite good what he said. Electrical energy production in Germany is 40 to almost 50 percent renewables. That's good because in future we uh, need much more uh, electrical car, not just for mobility, but also for industry because the industry wants to get rid of carbon. And that means transformation to electrical processes. So for instance, if you had a gas heating, you now have an electric heating. This is to say, instead of having a gas heater, you have electricity heaters. That's good. But in addition, we need a lot of intelligence and intelligent system to link all that. So I would say, become an engineer when you study, because this is something we need specialists in the future to actually uh, solve these problems. There's another question. The public transportation public should be expanded, but it is very complex to do that. And it's difficult to expand public transport. Have you really some 
approach for solution. I think in Bielefeld it's quite done. We have the tram, we have the bus. Is what's making is a fast bus connection. There is one in the reason uh, to Ingels. But look at the university. The university has been built outside of the city, and there are big parking spaces. Some of the old ones know that, but we don't have that now. And now we have a. Now we have a tram. The tram connections has been um, expanded. I come from. Ottinghausen, that's near Erfurt, and take a bus takes really long time. I take the um, tram, and we need really something like a network, and we really need that soon. If I think that we had a structure, and that structure was demolished, the small track trains have been demolished in the mid of the 80s. But now we have to build it up and make sure that that we have to be limited by planning horizons that go for decades. I think such a track in other people in other countries can be built in four years, but the German uh, train system needs 20 years. Why is that? Why? I think the safety, the security is not there so that one has really an alternative to a car and that one really takes the train and not the car, but one has to arrive actually. Deutsche Bahn has, is uh, relatively unreliable and that means that a lot of people take the car, this is to say a private car instead of the train, because with the train one can't be sure that one arrives on town to be sure that something fails. Of course, something can always fail, but Deutsche Bahn is much, much, much too often. So one wants to have the security that one arrives, that one can rely on punctuality. And if you take the car, uh, are you sure you arrive on time? Not 100%, because there are bottlenecks. That's very good what you asked me. I'm from Hannover. Hannover is very good. We are the center of everything that's around us. Uh, where I have to go to Hamburg, to Bielefeld, to Dusseldorf, to Berlin, or Frankfurt. I do all that by car, uh, by train. And early on, I did that by car, and I noticed zwei Stunden schneller als ich mit dem Auto das jemals bin und ich kann so schnell fahren wie ich lustig bin with the car i can i can ride as far as i want but it is the traffic it's the roads everything that happens on the road it's not faster on the road than by train i think it's a mindset also I like driving electrically I go from Hanover to Stuttgart. It, it takes four and a half um, hours with a combustion engine. Maybe it works. But if I have my telephone conference planned such that at the stops when I have to charge, I don't move, then I can make my conferences. It is rethinking. If I'm with the train, I uh, can uh, work. Um, at the train, in the train, and I plan an additional hour for, say, delayed trains. I just talked from my perspective. And not often in other cities. But once I have taken the train, I always had problems. One of them didn't come, several didn't come. And I think others have the same experience. And then they just take the car to be safe. That's all I wanted to say. And now I let my Fabian, thank you very much for all your questions. And we have a new discussion partner. Volker Wecklen, our minister, said we need more roads in future. What's your 
opinion about having more roads? Um, also, ich, okay. Ich weiß nicht, wie man das sagen soll. Ist, I don't know how to say it. That's just rubbish. Wir haben eine Menge ökologische Probleme. We have a lot of ecological problems, ecological product problems. Sag mal so Schlagwörter, ne? They, that are not only interested in the green scene, but they're so fun. Fundamental that our existence is a state. For instance, we have land, we use concrete on it, plants can't work, water can't go, sicker individual traffic in car, and I think we agree on that is not really where we need even more. If the current federal traffic manager in a government who has been forced by the Constitutional Board to talk about the climate crisis, and then they say we need more roads, then I don't know what to say without uh, getting furious, without cursing. That, in my opinion, is just complete rubbish. I have to say something in favor of our traffic manager. I'm quite critical when they want more roads, but one thing is maintenance of the current status quo. It cannot be that um, highways are actually closed by uh, some sort of authority so that they don't break down. We are an industrial country, and it's also in the interest of the pupils that this continues to be so. Germany as a nation and as an economy has continued to work and we have to make sure that we can also take part in the global um, competition. It, it makes no uh, sense because industry goes abroad because we don't have enough roads. We have to find a balance between maintenance without new construction and transformation. I understand the sentence or your statement from Volker Wissen a bit differently. Namely, I think if you talk about new roads or looking for more roads, it's not that one establishing new roads because we have quite a dense and the best highway uh, network on in the world, okay, uh, the speed limit or the fact that we don't have a speed limit means that there are roads that are so good that one could actually drive very fast. I think for Kravisin, that's the minister, or I hope maybe I should really say that he, he, that he says, take actually the traffic out of city, build new uh, roads outside of city in order to get rid of traffic in towns. Okay, the interpretation is something one can think about it, but this is the only reason that I can think of why the minister said that. Again, back, back to the ECAS. They're driven by batteries. And of course, when they're empty, they can be judged. But they lose a lot of life, and then one has to replace them. How do you do that? Best not at all. First of all, the life of such a vehicle is not zero. It has a use cycle. If you have a battery for a car that can't be used, then it still has 90% of capacity. Uh, you can do that with a test on the iFind and you can see how much charge the battery still has between 80 and 90% and you can still use it. But reach is lost when batteries are at the end of life for cars, then you have the end of life and further use of that battery. For instance, in stationary reservoirs or in larger systems is still possible, one could say. For a bus that goes between Herford 
and Bielefeld and only needs this distance I use four or five of the small car batteries. They have then a bigger battery, but it's enough in order to, it's a new use for a bus. And once again, that use is a thing, second life um, reservoir, then those batteries, and that's happening, are recycled. And all the raw materials are taken out without a lot of battery consum uh, uh, energy consumption. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. So, public transportation should be expanded as it cannot, the status quo cannot continue. Thank you very much. So, we finish with the panel discussion. Thank you very much. And thank you for your attention. Wir würden im Programm nun weitermachen mit dem Bielefelder Netzwerk der Schulen. Wieso oder beziehungsweise wie schaffen es Schulen etwas zu verändern? Gibt es da Konzepte und wie diese Konzepte aussehen werden? How do schools succeed in changing things? And how are projects being put into practice? Okay. Well. Ach, jetzt ist egal, wir ziehen das jetzt durch. Also. Ja. Äh, Good. Oh, ich sehe schon, ne? Es hat sich schon ein bisschen gelichtet. Well, there are a few people have left and we are getting nearer to the end. Bernd Matthäus is my name and I'm the spokesperson of the network, educational training for sustainable development. That's a day of education, Tag der Bildung. And therefore I'd like to turn back the time a little bit. We've now talked about global things, how the energy transformation can happen. I think most of you are up and awake now again. A great appreciation to the audience still here. You don't think that I can say now we've got climate technology, we've got system planning specifiers, we need lots of people starting a dual education for heat pumps uh, and other things. We need trades and crafts people for that, experts for that. So we represent 14,000 school students, basically six vocational colleges, a dual apprenticeship system. One or the other person will be We'll see some of you again at the schools and also some schools where you can reach full abitur. What we did at the individual schools are projects, projects similar to the ones that we heard about today. Maybe you can tell us a little bit about what's currently happening at the Berufskollegs, the vocational colleges. So once a year, 
We started uh, do, we start collecting donations, 10 euros per room, per classroom. We uh, collected 1,700 euros last time, and 170 trees could be planted with that money. And another action. Plenty of you will know, or all of us know, that Ukraine has been involved in a war with Russia for more than a year now. Our school did not really shy away from doing something about it. Our school collected uh, almost 1,100 euros in order to support Ukraine. Well, there is a company called Sustainable School Students Company. Well, we cover a wide range of different things at the different vocational colleges, covering lots of different professions also. And you come from business administration, correct? Hello, also from us, so we are uh, in Kasseri Vocational College for Business and Administration. We also deal with sustainability. We set up a student company, Be Green, where we are selling bottles, sustainable top bottles made of glass with bamboo lids. We support sustainable projects such as the uh, donation to the children's hospice, hospice and uh, Bethlehem. Okay, in general, there are individual projects, there are initiatives, there are um, very passionate students and also teaching staff. But looking further up, that's not just something that's technologically quite difficult to manage. It doesn't work on your own. The 17 sustainability goals deal with the entire range of life, health, social elements, and so on and so forth. So you have to shift away the focus from the technological areas, which means for us, if you have dedicated colleagues, that everything may work well by chance that we deal with these 17 goals. Now at the vocational colleges, we figured that, I mean, they're individual projects. We uh, initiate initiatives and that uh, is then channeled into a certain direction. If we want to offer education for sustainable development and would like to implement these 17 goals, Systematically, and systematically means top-down. Top-down, we intend to create structures, support structures, so that we're going ahead systematically. There are six vocational colleges, and the buzzword is participation. Participation, you join forces, stand shoulder by shoulder. Uh, it's one thing to do that at, uh, in, in one school, but it's much better to do that all together. And so the six colleges have now formed a network, which we've had for half a year now. What are our objectives? Mutual support, of course, and also having an exchange to look around. What are you doing? What are we doing? How can we help each other and support each other? And how can we also start joint projects? So what has happened? And how can we make that more systematic? Or how can we create a structure that we can use in the different schools? A memorandum was composed in order to de define what kind of support a school needs 
to teach that systematically in the classroom, but also in the entire life and at one of our colleges or schools. So who will do that? You need people, responsible people in charge, who will specifically focus on that, similar to a media representative. Last but not least, we developed also a concept for one of the sites for one school or one college. What has to happen in order to have a development towards sustainability? I mean, of course, there are different responsibilities. I have to define precisely who's responsible for what. Things have to be documented. What's happened? during the different project, what happens everywhere. And you have to document that and make it available to the others. Then reasonable communication has to be set up. You have to have an exchange, not just uh, that I call you incidentally because I wanted to talk to you about something, but there have to be clear dates and deadlines and structures. Continuous improvement process, you know all about that. When one or the other amongst you makes a suggestion at school, be it SV or another one, then it has to be absolutely clear that uh, this is then treated systematically, it, that, that it's not just uh, getting lost somewhere on the, on the way, but that that person will get clear feedback what happened about his or her suggestion. Then responsibilities. In uh, our College for Electrical Engineering, we uh, created a structure with responsibilities, with the facility manager, uh, administration, back office, faculty. Everybody has to move towards sustainability because otherwise nothing much will happen in the life of the school. Oh, thanks for the applause. And, uh, either you, you know me or you. Now, our, our network pursues the objective to use the materials that we've um, produced and pass them on, um, be it documents for learning or a certain situation or what I reported on planning an educational day at two of the colleges. Oh, we addressed, uh, we did that especially at the College for um, Business and Administration, that all those who are involved will talk about sustainability, there will be brainstorming, how the school can be prepared for that. Two concepts were developed and we love to really share them with you. We don't want to stay within our own premises, but other types of schools, are also represented. There can also be a network. The ideas behind it. Just ask around in the school, is there a concept that you can use around sustainability? Do you have something like that? We brought it along and we are also quite happy where we also have that our email address. You can also apply it, yeah. And to present everything, what kind of thing did we do? We provide our knowledge and everything that you need. And then that basically takes us to the end, because whether we are talking about transport transformation, that's a, an important point, but it's about sustainability in general. You have to look how can I shape the future sustainability? Everything starts with education. The stay of education says that's the alpha and omega. 
where we, if we start thinking sustainably, that more and more schools in Bielefeld get started, Bielefeld as a sustainable community, it also always states to be a sustainable community, then that would be a great thing. Education, to prepare people for the junctures of the future, be it in kindergarten, be it at a vocational school. Never mind, but we'll succeed by embarking on the way to focusing more on these 17 goals, regardless of the type of school that you're talking and regardless of what part of school you're talking in, in, of, of the school you're talking about, including cafeteria. Now that brings us back to the regional level. Bielefeld, locally, schools in Bielefeld, we are happy to share what we have. So a big thank you to all the school students who were with us today. Okay, that brings us to the end of the agenda. We learned a lot about sustainability today. We heard a lot of new things. We also wanted to convey new approaches. We talked a lot about climate in general, but would you please wait a minute before leaving? We heard about new concepts and the result is the summaries. We will only succeed if we walk that way together. Small little things will change the whole world. Last but not least, let's take a picture. That's why I can't ask everyone to come here to the front. Uh, the stage is not very big, but I think it should be big enough to uh, really for all of us and after that uh, you can grab a bite to eat outside and have a look around at the market of opportunities. So we'll take a picture, please come to the stage and we'll take a photograph. Maybe our photographer, in-house photographer of the University of Light Sciences is here. No, he's already gone. Please join us on stage because you are the stars today because you'll decide about the shape of our future by making pressure on industry and politics today. Please join us all on stage.